Many thanks for choosing us. There was no show in class on the various university campuses across the country as lecturers defied a court order for them to call off their strike, which is now in its sixth week. An Accra High Court on Tuesday granted an injunction application by the National Labor Commission asking the lecturers to return to the negotiation table. This is the second time the NLC is securing such an order to force UTAC to suspend its strike over similar demands in only six months. And just like they did to the first UTAC members, they have refused to return to the classroom. We have the national president of UTAC on the line now, Dr. Samuel Nkuban. He will tell us more. Uh, Doc, I'm grateful for your time this afternoon. When is UTAC returning to the classroom? Well, good afternoon and good afternoon to the US. Yes, Doc, you are, you are on, uh, joining us today. When is UTAG returning to the classroom? Hello, Dr. Nkoban. There seem to be connectivity challenge with Dr. Nkoban's line. We'll try and get him back on to tell us when they intend to go back to the classroom. Let's now take you across the various universities for updates on what's happening. We'll start with my colleague, Manuel Quantin, who has been monitoring activities at the University of Ghana. I came to have my private studies. Okay. Yes, that's why I came here. But are you aware that um, your lectures, for instance, were supposed to have come uh, to class today? Yes, I heard about that yesterday and I also came here. I didn't see anything about that, whether they have called off the strike or not. I didn't see any lectures going on. But what was your expectation? I was expecting that they will follow the court orders so that they will come to come back to lectures hall so that we to enjoy the lectures. Yes. As, as a level 100 student, you have been here to have your very first lecture, properly speaking, in the university. This must be quite devastating for you. Yes, please. And it's just our first time, and we don't even know like what we are to do. Like, even we don't have any handouts to start doing our own uh, studies. So we are just stranded. Yes, we are just stranded. So you want your lecturers, am I hearing you say you want your lecturers to listen to the court and return to class today? Yes, per my candid opinion, they should. Let's listen to Dr. Nkoban, who is the um, president of UTAG at the University of Ghana, uh, uh, University of Ghana, Lagos. Dr. Nkoban, I'm grateful for your time. When is UTAG returning back to the classroom? Uh, thank you very much, and uh, good afternoon to viewers. The uh, point is made that whilst we were at the court yesterday, the uh, NLC secured an injunction on the uh, Utah industrial action. And, of course, the pronouncement was made by the judge orally, and the expectation from our legal team is to get the certified um, copy uh, which is drawn from the judgment that was read out, and then uh, they would uh, pick it from there and advise UTAG accordingly in terms of what our next line of action should be. Mm. So um, your lawyer said you were studying the, uh, the order. Uh, have you, are you done with that already? Um, not at the moment because we are expecting the details of the ruling in relation to the uh, order that was made by the judge. And so once that comes true, then our uh, lawyers would be in the position to advise us on what we need to do. So what does this mean that uh, your demands have been uh, settled? Not as yet, because uh, we and government have not uh, reached a conclusion at the moment in terms of what they need to give to us in order for us to return the classroom. But in your last meeting, what, what transpired? Essentially, government is of the view that we needed to call off the strike before they can make any offer in relation to what our demands are. And you will recall also that last year we were at that big point where we had to concede by suspending our strike for the 
uh, negotiations to continue. And we had a one-month period within which to have concluded all outstanding matters, and we're still at the same point. And so it's difficult for us to, at this time, still abide by any promises and MOAs signed between us and government in relation to having to deal with the specific concerns regarding our conditions of service. Uh, so um, the court has asked you to go back to the classroom. As we speak now, you are not there. Are you defying the court's order? It is not a case. We, like I've indicated clearly, that we are expecting to get a certified uh, drawn order from the pronouncement of the judge yesterday, and then on the basis of that, we can uh, take a decision, and our lawyers can advise us on what to do. Should we expect you in the classroom? Not until we have uh, had our engagements with our lawyer, and uh, we know what the uh, details of the order. Uh, entails and what we should be doing. Dr. Nkoban is president of the University of Ghana chapter of the uh, UTAG and he says they're still studying that court order and the leadership will decide whether to go to the classroom or not. I'm grateful for your time this afternoon. We can go back to the University of Ghana where students are disappointed that the, their lecturers are not back in the classroom for lectures. But uh, you, you were expecting to see your lecturers today in class? Oh yes, I was expecting, per the court ruling yesterday, I was expecting them to call off the strike today. But then we came here and there are no lecturers, so I was just doing my personal studies. Mm. And this is what you've been doing the entire, what, six weeks or so? That uh, yes, that's what I've been doing, so that when school resumes, I wouldn't be able to, I would be able to catch up. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And, and, and so now that they are not coming, what are you taking away? Are you going to go home or are you going to go back to your hall? Um, for now, I think I'll just be on campus and have my personal study because if I go home, um, my parents will bombard me with um, errands, so I don't want to go. So I'll be on campus and have my personal studies. <laughs> so you're you are skipping errands. Uh, but but are, you, are you hoping that even though they are not in class today, they'll come, you know, soon? Yes, because as student and as a final year student, I'm expecting that this strike is going to be over because even per the court ruling, when they come back, it's going to really, I don't know how the university is going to structure our academic calendar because we are expecting to have 11 weeks and we've already spent five weeks out of class and it's really going to affect some of us, especially the final year student. All indications in the media yesterday, I knew the lectures would not be on campus, but you know, see for yourself. Okay. So that's why I'm here. And I saw some friends, so we were just talking. And this, this is, is, is it disappointing to you or you are in support of your lecturer's decision not to come to the class? Hmm. I really want my lecturers back to class, but knowing that when they return to class, after a few weeks, they may also, you know, go back. Go back. I, I feel like they should just be on strike and get all their issues resolved. Then they can come to us. Then we'll be ready for them. And those were students at the University of Ghana. Meanwhile, UTAC president at the University of Cape Coast, Dr. Samuel Bed Boidikusi, says the substantive issue of the condition of service for lecturers should not be ignored. I, I do not disagree with you on this point at all. I do not disagree with you. But the point is that, I mean, we, it is also important that, I mean, we have a legal team in place. And, and therefore, it's important that we, we we listen to what they are they are they are I mean the direction they have, but other than that, it is clear. I mean the, the judge has spoken, and I don't I, I don't think that it will be proper for anybody to disrespect the orders of the court or to dis, disrespect the orders of the judge. Uh, it is clear. But then again, in in carrying out that function, which is clear, it is also proper that. The writer is done. That I mean, you look at uh, all the all the issues that there are, there are, and of course, what the exactly the judge uh, I mean ordered, and then we, we move it from from there. I do not think that that also it's just uh, stretching the matter. No, not at all. Uh, it's important that we don't just presume that these are the specific orders. So we need to look at what are the specific orders that came in. And then we, we carry it from there. I, I don't think that we, it's anybody wants to stretch this matter. I have said in the past that uh, litigation is not the way to go. At the end of the day, uh, whatever we are doing is about conditions of service. So if you're going to spend all your time in court, uh, 
uh, and not touching the substantive matter, then we, we, we are not moving, we are not moving on. I mean, that is not what our members want. But of course, we were not the first people to even head to court. It's, it's the NLC that took us to court. So uh, let's follow the, the advice of the legal team and then we'll move it from there. So the you have said this before, uh, you didn't honor your part of the bargain. So now trust is a bit difficult. But beyond that, I, I think that uh, the employer should take the condition of service matter critical and then invite the union to sit and discuss these matters uh, in a very open and transparent manner, very frank manner, and uh, try to resolve that, that issue because it affects, the, it affects morale. Right. Uh, we don't want a situation where people will go back and then they, they are even not effective at what they are doing. Uh, it affects morale. So once there is that goodwill and that assurances that your conditions, something ought to be done about it. I think that it's something that we all of us need to rally around the table and get this resolved within the shortest possible time. The minority in parliament is demanding the immediate suspension of what they describe as clandestine hikes in electricity tariff. Ranking member on the Energy and Mines Committee, John Janapo, observed that the price hikes have been enforced since the beginning of February this year without the knowledge of the consumers, a situation he described as insensitive. In an interview with Joy News, the Yape Kosogo MP said there are plans to hold the sector minister and officials of PURC before the House if they ignore calls to suspend the new charges. And the mind checks indicate that ECG started implementing some price adjustment with their services and charges. And this came to my attention today. My checks indicate that indeed they are charging some new fees on what they call new service connection charges. These are 10 different line items. By the PRC Act, it's only the PRC that can approve tariffs or fees or charges in relation to supply of electricity and its related services. And when they do that, they are supposed to inform consumers. Sorry. And so how they can clandestinely increase these service charges without recourse to the general public baffles some of us. It's inappropriate, it's unfortunate, and ought not to happen. And so what we are requesting and asking the PRC and the service providers to do is to suspend it. They should suspend it? They should suspend these increments with immediate effect. But and that we use whatever parliamentary processes that are necessary to ensure that the right thing is done. But these charges already uh, in, 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 has been implemented, I mean? Yes, my information is that they started implementing them from the 1st of February. Mm. Today is around 16th of February. Mm. So clearly over two weeks, they're supposed to be implementing that. And I think that that's unfortunate. We would not allow that. We want the right thing done. And one says that the right thing is done. But you know that the economy, of course, and you have talked about the economy, you know, the needs. And so if government wants to add a little, I mean, to electricity tariffs uh, so that they can procure or purchase the power for supply, isn't that a good cause? Because you have claimed that the economy is on its knees, sir. This is even about their, their, their services that they provide. So first of all, that cannot be a justification. Two is that... If you want to increase any service fee or charge, mm. it ought to be done within due process, mm. within law, in accordance with law, and ensure that the right thing is done. And so they cannot increase that clandestinely. Consumers and customers must know. That's the first thing. If you have a legitimate cause to increase, it, we must know. And a joint news on corruption watch investigation has uncovered the illegal collection of fees for blood by a syndicate operating with the National Blood Service at the Kolibu Teaching Hospital and the Greater Accra Regional Blood Bank. At the Greater Accra Regional Hospital, a staff collected 300 Ghana cities for a pint of blood, while the leader of a syndicate operating within the National Blood Service at Kolibu Teaching Hospital demanded 750 cities for a pint of blood. Executive Officer of the National Blood Service, Dr. Justin Ansa, says no patient is expected to pay more than 150 Ghana cities for the processing of blood. Joy News Investigative Desk and Corruption Watchers Francisca Encho investigates the distressing experience 
many patients go through as a result of this illegal practice. In Ghana, there is high blood scarcity as the blood banks are not able to collect enough to meet the demand. For patients in dire need of blood transfusion, they either have to pay exorbitant fees charged by some hospitals or go through middlemen who facilitate the illegal purchase of blood at the hospitals. This lady who pleaded anonymity said she is being asked to pay 250 Ghana cities for a pint of blood. Cost is therefore a barrier to patients who need blood to survive. In case of any eventuality. But no more general. And say, be so a manner emergency. And say, you be a man in ye mojano. Now say it all. Two hundred and fifty. That is the plight of some relatives of patients who are desperately in need for blood for their families on admission to the hospital. Unfortunately, the fees charged for blood has left them distraught. This middle-aged woman says blood bank operators she contracted demanded 400 Ghana cities for a pint. The National Blood Service says blood is not supposed to be sold. However, one is required to pay a processing fee to run laboratory tests on blood requested for transfusion. The service says the cost of processing this blood should not exceed 150 Ghana cities. Chief Executive Officer of the National Blood Service, Dr. Justin Ansa, reveals the shortage of voluntary blood donations is the reason for the abuse of the system by unscrupulous individuals. Because of the scarcity and artificial shortage that is created, people who want to make, um, take advantage of the system because there's always shortage, also for the, so there will be somebody who pays the processing fee group and cross margin to the bank giving a receipt, but around the person, they may also have gotten somebody to come and donate for them, or and then would have paid some money. So these are some, but to be able to care that, I will repeat, that we need to make sure that blood is an essential commodity. It's, 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 we have it in excess. The sale of blood has become lucrative because only 6 out of every 1,000 of Ghana's population donate blood. The expected minimum is 10 out of every 1,000. According to the National Blood Service, the national voluntary blood donation rate has declined steeply from 34% of total blood donations in 2019 to 17% in 2020. Dr. Ansar adds that over the same period, the percentage of voluntary donations collected by blood centers in Accra, Kumasi and Tamale has recorded a corresponding decline from 52% in 2019 to 24% in 2020. So I just want to state that we don't have enough blood. We're only meeting about 60% of our collections uh, of what we need as a country. So definitely some people will be disadvantaged, which means that some people will not get blood when they need and it will affect more of emergencies. In order to find out how official and unofficial sale of blood occurs at some of our hospitals, our investigative team went undercover at Kolibu Teaching Hospital and the Greater Accra Regional Hospital, formerly known as Ridge Hospital. At the Kolibu Teaching Hospital, we approached Eric Mensah, popularly referred to as Akwesi, among his peers, a man in his early 30s. He claimed to work at the blood bank situated at Kolibu Teaching Hospital. Our follow-up investigations established that he is the leader of a syndicate that facilitates the illegal purchase of blood at the hospital. We told him we needed blood for a patient with ovarian cancer. He demanded 750 Ghana cities for a pint of blood, but after intense negotiation, he reduced it by 50 Ghana cities. So we agreed to pay 700 Ghana cities. <laughs> 
We did not have the required blood sample and requisition form from an accredited hospital, but Akwesi took down payment of 100 Ghana cities, promising to give us blood once we pay in full. After providing blood sample and a requisition form, he provided the investigative team with a pint of blood. He did not give us a receipt for this transaction. It was the same for this desperate woman who needed a blood type O plus for the patient on admission at Kolebu. The request also did not go through the proper channel. The right thing to do was that the blood sample and requisition form should have been submitted at the designated post at the blood bank and an official receipt issued for the cost of processing the blood. Many other patients we spoke to shared similar stories of exploitation by some staff of the blood bank. We asked Chief Executive Officer of the National Blood Service, Dr. Justina Ansa, whether she is aware of the middlemen operating as a syndicate that facilitate illegal sale of blood at the Kolebu Teaching Hospital. Because of the scarcity and artificial shortage that is created, people who want to make um, take advantage of the system because there's always shortage also for so there will be somebody who pays the processing fee group and cost margin to the bank giving a receipt but around the person they may also have gotten somebody to come and donate for them or and then would have paid some money. The investigative team also visited the Greater Accra Regional Hospital, formerly Reach Hospital, to look into the illegal sale of blood. At the facility, an official at the blood bank demanded 300 cities for a pint of blood. <laughs> We submitted a blood sample and requisition form with details of a hospital located in the Ashanti region. They did not do any further due diligence to ascertain that the facility was in the national capital but gave us the blood in a flask to be given to the patient. The medical director of the Greater We can now go to Parliament where the minority is carrying out a vote of censure against the Health Minister Gokwajiman Meno on the Sputnik V saga. Let's get on the line and speak with our man Paka Wilson who is in Parliament for us. Paka, tell us more about this vote of censure. Right, Aisha. So the report from the committee 
that was constituted to look into the procurement of the Sputnik V, uh, brought their report to the plenary where the House, just about 10, 15 minutes ago, adopted a report. We are yet to be finished with the details of that report. But shortly after that, I had a source who sent me a motion put together by the 137 NBC MPs, signing it as a motion of censure against the Health Minister, and they have cited six reasons why they believe that the motion of censure uh, should be against the minister. And I'm going to give read a few to you uh, the reasons they, are, they, they, they think that they need to vote against him. Now, the one most important to the NDC minority is that the minister went into a transaction with Al Maktoum without the prior approval of parliament, which contravenes or contradicts Article 181 of the Constitution. Again, the same minister went into the agreement with uh, Sheikh Al Maktoum without the prior approval of the Board of the Public Procurement Authority, and finally also costing the payment of over uh, 2.8 million Ghana uh, million dollars um, to the Sheikh without again prior approval of the board. So these are some of the reasons the minority has given uh, for moving the motion of censure against the health minister. Of course, I yet to get a reaction from the majority and even speak to uh, the minority themselves to have a better appreciation of why uh, they have decided to embark on this quest to get the health minister removed from office. How is the speaker reacting to this? This did not happen on the floor of the house. The speaker only adopted the report. He put a question, uh, the motion to a vote, and then the house voted and adopted the report. The, the memoranda or the motion for vote of censure hasn't been to the floor yet. We intercepted the document and we have indicated to our viewers that this is what is happening. And so soon we'll get a reaction from the majority and the minority side as well. Definitely get updates on this and get reaction from the majority side on this one. Parker Wilson is our man in parliament. Let's move on from parliament to other stories. The Association of Magistrates and Judges says it will be lodging a formal complaint against Medina MP Francis Susu. Mr. Susu, during a street protest, served notice that political judges will be dealt with. The comment has since been described by the Ghana Bar Association as reckless and a breach of the standards expected of a lawyer. Well, Mr. Susu fought back describing the Ghana Bar Association as useless. This afternoon, the Association of Magistrates and Judges are wading into the matter, serving notice of dragging the MP to the General Legal Council. Justice Henry Kofi is president of the association. The Association of Magistrates and Judges of Ghana, AMJG, has noted with grave concern and dismay a statement by Honorable Francis Xavier Susu, Member of Parliament for the Medina Constituency, that there are judges who he calls political judges. This statement of the Honorable Susu, who is a lawyer, was made during an interview he granted after a demonstration and is available on social media and on various radio stations. The statement was to the effect that some judges seek refuge and hide behind political parties and behave as, quote and unquote, political judges. He said, quote, if you make yourself a political judge, you will be treated politically, and your tenure of office will run with a political party that you favor, unquote. The association finds this statement of honorable Sosu against judges as unfortunate, reckless, and misguided, coming as it is from a member of parliament and a lawyer who should know better the question the association would like to ask Honorable Susu and his ilk are A. Who is a political judge? B. Who determines who is a political judge? And by what criteria is the determination made? 3. Who are the so-called political judges who are going to be dealt with? The association considers this statement of Honorable Susu as deliberate and calculated to create disaffection against the judiciary and an attempt to scandalize the judiciary and judges. And we condemn the self-statement in no uncertain terms. 
Judges do not determine which cases are filed or put before them for hearing. The statement of Honorable Francis Xavier Sosu is an attempt to intimidate judges who are doing nothing other than their normal work. The association takes a serious view of the statement of Honorable Sosu and considers it, considers it very unprofessional from a lawyer and an unprovoked attack on the judiciary. Having regard to the seriousness with the AMJG takes this statement and its potential to do undue damage to the image of the judiciary, the association is lodging a formal complaint against Honorable Sosu to the General Legal Council immediately for his unprofessional statement of utterances which have the potential to tarnish the image of the judiciary as a whole. The Bono Regional Chairman of the New Patriotic Party, Kwame Bafo, popularly known as Abronye DC, has been granted bail of 100,000 cities with two sureties. Abronye DC was put before an Accra Circuit Court on Wednesday after being charged with publication of false news, offensive conduct conducive to breach of peace. Mr. Bafo claimed that the 2020 flag bearer of the opposition NDC, John Mahama, had planned to stage a coup against the government. According to media reports, the NPP communicator made the claim on Hot 93.9 FM in Accra while responding to the arrest of Fix the Country convener Oliver Bakavoma, who also threatened to stage a coup should the e-levy be passed after the majority leader, Seche Mensa Bunsu, celebrated his 65th birthday with an e-levy designed cake. In view of this, he was invited for questioning on Tuesday, February 15, at the police headquarters to assist with investigations. Abronya DC was subsequently arrested. The police, in a statement, revealed that the NPP regional chairman failed to substantiate his claims. We're live on Joy News today. We'll take a break when we return. There's more in business. Hi, good afternoon. Welcome to business. My name is Daryl Kwao. Many see bars conducting in Ghana as a demanding profession meant for men. But Akofa, a final year student of the University of Ghana, has defied all odds by juggling it with academics. My colleague James Ishan tells her story. Adina, Adina, Adina. I, want, I called him and like, I want to do a mate job. He said, no, you can't do it. I'm like, look, I can do it. He said, it's for mainly, it's difficult, so he would rather prefer a meal. And I told him, look, Give me three days. If I don't perform, just let me go. Serve me. So at times I go to lectures on weekends. At times too, I don't go. Doesn't that affect you? If I don't studies? go a day, it affects my finances. So if I don't work a day, so I mix it. If I go this week, probably next week, I'll go to lectures. Yeah, at least I try to read myself too. So. As far as I don't go to anybody, give me food, give me this. I can do something to feed myself too cater for myself, everybody should back up. Let me just do my thing. What, did, did you have a discussion with your landlord um, on the very first day, after the very first day, what you went to, because... No. So no. how come he concluded that you couldn't wake up? Uh, I don't know. He said he has done it before. It's very difficult, so uh, he doubts if I can do it. You know, a lot of people underestimate people. You know, they see you and they think you are too feeble. You can't do this, you can't do that. But look, I'm a very strong person. At the end of the day, I know that nobody's change is here, except I have money folded like this. But I remember those days when, when I was in this position, there are times I used to mafia. Let me use the word mafia. The My trouble driver, aspect, eh? Exactly, the trouble. <laughs> <laughs> in this case, do you also, is there anything okay. of that sort? It's okay. Mm. You said you were going to long journeys. Yeah, that was Madina to Isawo. So probably you get some trouble. Mm. This one, the driver knows how much he gets get in a one set. So even if you do pick and drop, pick and drop, how many people will you pick on the road? So you can't steal the person. Well, the full feature will be airing soon. Be on the lookout. In other news this afternoon, Ghanaian food manufacturing industries have been aired to adopt aesthetic presentations of local cuisines. Pro Vice Chancellor of the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, Professor Ellis Osu Dabo, 
says adding value to indigenous foods will enhance export, generate income, and sustainably preserve local dishes. He spoke at this year's edition of the KNUST Food Festival aimed at contributing to the attainment of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Emmanuel Bright Kweku has more. 2022 edition of the KNUST Food Festival brought together students and staff from diverse cultural backgrounds. It was a platform for the rich display of the Ghanaian culture and heritage through local cuisines and dances. Dubbed Achieving the SDGs, Our Food, Our Culture, Our Health, the event saw various departments of the university and local businesses showcasing their indigenous foods and agricultural products. Pro Vice Chancellor of KNUSD, Professor Ellis Double, says a decorative presentation of local dishes would attract commercialization. We need to learn the art of food presentation. Uh, first, uh, we can talk about the whole value chain, but importantly for us now, as you saw during the rounds uh, we had in the last few minutes, the, the presentation of the, of the food uh, type brings value. And I guess as a country, we're interested in value addition as far as uh, our products are concerned. So that we be able to export these things, uh, seek for partners who will be interested in ensuring that the manufacturing chain is uh, enhanced. Ghana's local delicacies stand at a gradual extinction due to the influx of exotic cuisines over the last decade. Bemoaning the diminishing popularity of, of Ghanaian dishes, keynote speaker, Professor Daniel Dia called for the integration of culture into the 2030 SDG agenda. According to him, the protection and promotion of diverse cultural expressions are the core components of human and sustainable development. Culture must be regarded as the fourth pillar of sustainability, and I fully align with this assertion. For instance, there have been calls for the inclusion of one specific goal to be devoted to culture or better still, an integration of cultural aspects across the SDGs for easy adaptation and implementation contextually. Ashanti Regional Director of Agriculture, John Menu, assured the government's flagship program, Planting for Food and Jobs, aims at creating a thriving environment for local agricultural businesses. Currently, the national policy is to promote planting for food and jobs. So at the end of the day, Government is subsidizing seed and fertilizer for farmers so that they can produce more of our local food. For Joy News, Emmanuel Bright Kweku reporting. And we've got more business stories to report on the marketplace at the top of the hour. Up next, sports. Time now for sports. On Joy News today with me, Muftar Nabila Abla, Ghana referee. Daniel Lyer is optimistic the experience gathered at the 2021 African Cup of Nations will help him improve in his officiating career. Lyer, who is regarded as the best center referee in Ghana at the moment, was the country's sole representative at the Continental Football event where he officiated the match involving Guinea and Malawi. He's been speaking about the opportunities officiating at the tournament presents to him. It's, it's a good feeling because this is what we are or what we were working on and uh, it's a stage in my career where it's going to move me to another stage so it's a good feeling um, I was supposed to be at the 2019 I had uh, a candy selection but I couldn't make the cut but this time I was able to make it um, we didn't have any tension on us because uh, over the years we've been to uh, some of um, the organized tournament in Africa, Chan. So there was no tension. But the only thing is, you know, you are there with um, top referees, World Cup referees from Africa. So that's kind of, you want to also be like them, what they are doing. You are watching whatever they are doing so that you can be like them. This is the, but there was no tension. We were ready for the tax because we've been through equal tax like that. Well, for CAF now, we, they, they have a ranking. I always talk about this um, stage in refereeing where there are new referees, and then we have the young talent, and then Elite B, and then Elite A. 
Away from football, let's do something on boxing. And boxing promoters in the country have thrown their weight behind Richard Comey's refusal to pay the Ghana Boxing Authority a percentage of his purse for December's fight against Vasily Lomachenko. Here is president of the Ghana Boxing Promoters Association, Alex Intiamwa. The underlining word is a boxer licensed by the Ghana Boxing Authority. Comey for about four years now is not licensed by the Ghana Boxing Authority. He fights in the U.S. And in the U.S., each and every state that you have to fight and uh, you're supposed to fight at, you need to get your license there. And when you fight, they take, you pay taxes. So from Azuma Nelson, Aikote, uh, Alfred Kote, uh, Joshua Clote, Joseph Agbeko, none of them has paid any fee with regards to their fight in the U.S. till today. The GBA attempted to have a way to get monies from boxers fighting from the U.S., from Kote's uh, 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 Kote administration. They gave a position to uh, Emmanuel Tego's uh, manager or advisor, Peter Khan, as an executive uh, uh, member for international relations, purposely for him to go to the commissions to seek for that money. But he knows that it cannot work in the U.S. because the boxers are licensed there. There is an opportunity for him to be regarded as the best ever tennis player, but Novak Djokovic insists he would rather sacrifice his career rather than take a COVID-19 vaccine. This is how we wrap up sports here on Joy News today with me, Muftar Nabila Abla. You can head on to myjoyonline.com and read some more sports stories. Good afternoon. Welcome to Showbiz here on Joy News today. Now, veteran high life. Musician J.W. Ambuli says his generation has failed to pass on the high-life legacy to the recent crop of musicians, the reason most of them are not doing high-life music. He spoke to Joy Entertainment. The older musicians are dying. When somebody is sick, it's not that they're going to go for performances to solicit money and then, come on. So there's nothing that is there. Now the building is taken out of them. They said they're going to give them another place. and. Those that are struggling to go there, I don't see how they're going to make the place the place because they don't have the information. They don't have that educational side of it. And they don't have the money to be able to establish something that, that needs to be established. But all these, the faults to all these are coming from we elders. We, the elder musicians, have made all these things to happen because we're supposed to teach the children and show the children the way. But the elders, I'm the days here, uh, uh, Abel can say working here, Pat Thomas is there, Ambuli is there, and uh, no, we sit, so when we sit down we think and we want to go to see the president, when the president hear the names, that do, he open the door. But the, the, the senior ones, they have failed the younger generation. Meanwhile, veteran musician Nana Fain has revealed investing in the arts here in Ghana is difficult because of industry players' attitude. I've been stuck for a long time. It's not a new thing. <laughs> because, you see, uh, there's no culture. Then again, uh, it comes back to culture. Mm. There's no culture of investing in the arts in Ghana. Not just music. Uh, I don't. Some, something visceral in our minds makes us feel uh, the arts, they say, agro, agro, okay, it's nothing to be taken seriously. You understand what mm -hmm. I mean? So, mm -hmm. our whole attitude towards uh, it itself is a problem. Mm -hmm. You even could you could you could have an interaction or uh, you, you could have disrespect from people, industry people, radio stations, TV stations, disrespecting artists in a way that is very appalling. <laughs> That's how we wrap up joining us today. My name is Aisha Ibrahim. Many thanks for watching. For more news, log on to myjohnline.com. You get updates of all the uh, developing stories. Enjoy the rest of our programs.